He was seen as the savior of his country after getting rid of his country's dictator, but soon he evolved to be one himself. On today's African History 101, we look into the life of Laurent Desiré Kabila, the liberator that failed to deliver. Laurent Desiré Kabila was born in Jodaville in the province of Katanga, a part of Bejen, Congo in 1939. He came from the Luba tribe. He completed his high school studies in Elizabethville and then studied political philosophy at a French university. He also attended the University of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. In 1960, when he was only 21, Laurent Dizé Kabila became a leader in a political movement allied to the first Prime Minister of Independent Congo, Patrice Lumumba. In 1961, General Mabutu Sesiseko deposed the Lumumba and the Congolese government had him assassinated on January 17, 1961. In response to this coup d'etat, Kabila and other Lumumba's loyalists started a guerrilla war with the support of Che Guevara in 1964. The revolt was suppressed in 1965 by the Congolese army with the U.S. support. General Mobutu Sesiseko took control of the nation in 1965, established a dictatorship, and in 1971 renamed the country to Zaire. To understand Kabila's ascending to power, it is important to understand the history of Rwanda genocide and its regional consequences. After the genocide perpetrated against the Tutsi, the Rwandan Patriotic Front defeated the Hutu government of Rwanda and about a million Hutu fled to surrounding countries, especially Zaire. The exodus was odd in that the entire army units crossed the border, as did government and political leaders. The Hutu refugees, having crossed an international boundary, came under the protection of the international community, especially United Nations High Commission for Refugees, which set up huge camps to house them near the Rwandan border. These camps were controlled by the same political structures and leaders which had previously been in command in Rwanda and had organized the genocide. Furthermore, the camps became bases for which guerrilla attacks were launched against the new regime in Rwanda. To add gasoline to the fire, Mabudu regime having been allied to Hayabriyamana regime in Rwanda continued to help the Hutu, and this included becoming a conduit for arms shipments destined for guerrilla fighters who attacked Rwanda. This was profoundly threatening to the new Rwandan government as well as the Congolese Tutsi. The Rwandan government repeatedly warned that it could not accept the presence of the people who had perpetrated the genocide not only camping on its borders but being allowed to arm and use UNHRCR camps as rear bases for which to attack Rwanda. The international community essentially deaf to these warnings, the Congolese Tutsi, having seen the genocide in Rwanda and the attacks were determined not to let the same thing happen to them. When the plan to operate another ethnic cleansing, this time against them, was close to execution, they descended from the highlands and conducted a preemptive strike against the Israeli army and the Hutu camps. This was the opportunity the Rwandan had been waiting for and they immediately crossed the frontier in support of the Tutsi. At the high speed, they attacked both the Fars and the Hutu camps. Uganda joined the operation for essentially the same, although less pressing reasons. anti museven forces including the Allied Democratic Forces, the Lord's Resistance Army, and the West Nile Bank Front were using Congo as rear base from which to launch attacks against Uganda. No doubt the long friendship and shared guerrilla experience between Museven and Rwanda's Vice President Major General Paul Kagame also contributed to this alliance. Museven and Kagame were wary of the danger that this operation would be viewed as an invasion, thus reducing its legitimacy. Hence, the need to give the conflict a Congolese character. This was difficult to achieve, not because there was no openness to the Mobutu regime. On the contrary, dozens of parties and leaders were committed to his downfall, but 
because most of them rejected violence protest. It was necessary to fall back on small exile groups and that were visually unknown and certainly had very few followers, but which favored the revolutionary methods. That's how Kabira came into the picture. It was at this moment that the Alliance of Democratic Forces for the Liberation of Congo, AFDL, was born, which united four parties that included Kabila was chosen as spokesman, probably in part because he was the oldest among the founders, but more importantly because he had a long history of anti-Mabutu protest going back to the 1960s. He had been a zone commander in South Kivu during the 1964-1965 Congo rebellion. The AFDL was supported by both Rwanda and Uganda. The AFDL became the front for the Congo invasion. By mid-1997, the AFDL had almost completely overrun the country and the remains of Mobutu's army. Only the country's dilapidated infrastructure slowed Kabila's forces down. In many areas, the only means of transit were illegally used the dirty path. Following failed peace talks held on board of South African warship between Kabila and Mobutu, Mediated by Nelson Mandela, Mabudu fled into exile on the 16th May. The next day, from his base in Lumbambashi, Kabila declared victory and installed himself as president. Upon taking power, Kabila told Reuters, My long years of struggle were like spreading fertilizer on a field, but now it's time to harvest. Kabila suspended the constitution and changed the name of the country from Zaire to Democratic Republic of Congo, the country official name from 1964 to 1971. He made his grand entrance into Kishasa on 20 May and was sworn in on the 31st May, officially commencing his regime as president. Upon taking power, Kabila faced a lot of problems, including difficulty in asserting his power to the grassroots. This was due to the fact that none of the four parties making up the AFTL had any grassroots structures or even substantial membership. Kabila also faced problems with the newly created Congolese army as it was made up with different factions who were not entirely loyal to Kabila. These factions included Banyamulenge warriors who had started the struggle but who were loyal to their self-interest. Child soldiers recruited during the march to Kishasa, the so-called the Kadogos, who were loyal to Kabila. Katanga Grande Armies who had joined the AFDL struggle against Mobutu, but were initially part of the Angolan army. The former Zaire's army, who were re-educated as they were soldiers that operated under Mobutu's Sesiseko's regime. Furthermore, Kabila relied on Rwanda's soldiers to help him retain power. Although hampered by many dependencies on Rwanda and Uganda in the eyes of the Congolese, Kabila successfully presented himself as an avid nationalist, fending off the designs of the imperial forces such as France, the UN, and the US. This made him at odds with the Western powers. Although having many shortcomings, Kabila's regime was successful in reducing inflation from 1,000% to 10%. This was accomplished with almost no foreign aid. The reduction of inflation helped ordinary poor Congolese. Kabila also improved the security of major cities in the country. Uganda and Rwanda had supported Kabila with a reason of reading out rebels around the border area, but once Kabila was in power, he did not hold his part of the bargain. This led to tension among allies. In July 1998, the Presidential Protection Unit, commanded by Rwandans, was disbanded without informing Kigali. Kabila attempted to disengage from his former allies by ordering all Rwandan troops to leave the DRC. Some of the defranchised armed groups formed a rebel group known as Rale for Congolese Democracy, RCD, 
which was supported by Uganda and Rwanda. The RCD launched a military attack to oust Kabila, steering Congo into a civil war. Kabila turned to new allies that included Robert Mugabe of Zimbabwe, Dos Santos of Angola, and Sam Mujoma of Namibia. All these countries sent troops to help Kabila to retain power for mineral concessions in the DRC. The civil war will outlast Kabila himself. Tell me in the comments if you want me to do a video on the Congo civil war and its economic costs to the country. Kabila was shot in his office on the 16th January 2001 by his bodyguard, a former child soldier named Rashid, and he, Kabila was taken to Zimbabwe for medical treatment. The Congolese government announced that he had died of his wounds on the 18th January. One week later, his body was returned to Congo for a state funeral, and his son Joseph Kabila became president 10 days later. Reasons why Kabila was shot is like finding out why was J.F. Kennedy assassinated. There are many conspiracies of why Kabila was assassinated, but 135 people, including four children, were tried before a special military tribunal. The allegedly ring leader, Colonel Ed Kapende, one of Kabila's cousins, and 25 others were sentenced to death in January 2003, but not executed. Of other defendants, 64 were jailed with the sentences ranging from six months to life, and 45 were exonerated. Kabila left his country in turmoil of civil war and problems with his neighboring countries. While he managed to get rid of the dictatorship of Maputo Sesiseko, he did little to steer his country to a path of economic development and stability. That was his major failure. What do you think should be done to end the Congolese civil war? Leave your comments below. If you have loved this video, please subscribe to African History 101 for more African stories.